Hey friends, welcome again this week to Parker Hill Church Online. I'm so glad you set aside this time to be here as we spend a few minutes just tuning out the noise of this world and reconnecting with the heart of our Father in Heaven. And today we're continuing a teaching series called Undrink the Kool-Aid. And the title of this series comes from the phrase, Drinking the Kool-Aid. I'm sure you've heard that phrase at one time or another. It actually comes from a tragic event that took place in 1978 when a cult leader named Jim Jones convinced 900 people to end their own lives by drinking Kool-Aid that was laced with poison. And so the phrase, drink the Kool-Aid, refers to someone who has been convinced to believe an idea that could actually hurt them. And so throughout this series, we're addressing some ideas that lots of people believe, ideas that sound correct, ideas that seem harmless, but ideas that if we consume them, will poison our souls. And the sad truth is this, we live in a world where so many people don't take the time to think deeply and think carefully about the really important issues of our lives, and so we buy into certain ideas simply because they are promoted by influential people. Uh, We live our lives by slogans and sound bites, and we end up embracing ideas that sound correct but are ultimately false. And so last week, we took a look at the intersection between science and faith. And if you missed that, you go back and watch last week's message on our website. And then over the next two weeks, we're going to get into some really practical life issues regarding values and moralities and, you know, should you do you or should you be the best version of yourself. The next couple of weeks are going to be really practical and interesting. But today we're addressing an idea that's very important. A lot of people have embraced this idea. It goes something like this. The Bible is outdated, inaccurate, and it can't be trusted. That's the Kool-Aid that a lot of people are drinking today. Many people today believe that soundbite, which is a tragedy, because when we embrace this idea, we are then rejecting the greatest source of wisdom available to us, and we end up living our lives without any real foundation. And so today, I want to take a little bit different approach to our teaching. Normally, what we do is we teach from the Bible. Today, I just want to teach about the Bible. And specifically, I want to talk about some of the reasons why people ignore or even outright reject uh, the Bible. And I'm going to do my best to ask and answer four questions that people have about the Bible. Question number one is this, isn't the Bible just another religious book? In other words, people say, well, you know, Muslims have the Quran, uh, Mormons have the Book of Mormon, and Christians have the Bible. It's just one religious book among many. Now, Whenever I hear somebody say that, I know immediately that they have no clue what they're talking about. Now, I'm not trying to be harsh. It's just that that is not even an accurate statement. Uh, To begin with, the Bible isn't even a book. It's actually a collection of books. It's a small library of ancient writings, 66 different documents. The earliest books of the Bible date back to around 1500 B.C., And the last books of the Bible were written about 60 or 70 A.D. And so the writings of the Bible span more than 1,500 years of history written by some 40 different authors. Now, personally, I believe that the greatest miracle of history isn't even in the Bible. To me, the greatest miracle of history is the Bible. I mean, think about this. What would you expect to find in a collection of 66 documents written over a time span of 1,500 years by 40 different people living in very different cultures in different times in history? Well, you would expect to find a jumble of ideas and all kinds of conflicting views and opinions. And yet when you examine the Bible, that's not what you find at all. What you find is many writers all contributing to the same story. One incredible, compelling story. It's like a choir of many voices singing different parts but contributing to the same song. Like a garment woven with many different threads but all part of the same fabric. That's the Bible. It's the beautiful interwoven story of God's pursuit of a broken human race. Now let me tell you why this is so important. When when you have a bunch of different witnesses all saying the same thing, then you know you can believe it. It's like an old story somebody gave me years ago. It goes like this. On a beautiful day, four of my daughter's friends decided to go for a drive instead of showing up to class on time. When they did arrive, the girls told the teacher they had had a flat tire. 
The teacher accepted the excuse, much to the girl's relief. Since you missed this morning's quiz, you must take it now, she said to them. Please sit in the four corner seats in this room without talking. When they were seated, the teacher said, on your paper, write the answer to one question. Which tire was flat? Now, if all four girls came up with the same answer, you could assume that it wasn't just a lucky guess. They were really telling the truth. And when you have 40 different authors over 1,500 years telling the same story, then you know that story has the ring of truth. Now, let me contrast the Bible with another religious book, the Book of Mormon. So the entire Book of Mormon was composed by one man. His name was Joseph Smith. Uh, Allegedly, he was visited by an angel one night in 1823 and given a set of gold tablets that contained what we read in the Book of Mormon. And so the entire Book of Mormon and the entire religion is based on the experience of one person, Joseph Smith. So here's my question. Uh, How do you check that out? Like, how do you confirm that? You see, the Bible is unique because it isn't the writings of one man who came along and said, God told me this, and I wrote it down, so you need to believe it. No, it is the testimony of many, many people across many, many centuries. So, if someone were to ask you, isn't the Bible just another religious book? Here's how you can answer that question. You can say, no, the Bible is actually a collection of writings that tell one story. And the harmony and consistency of the Scriptures can only be described as supernatural. Okay? Here's question number two. Very common question. Isn't the Bible just a bunch of myths and legends? In other words, we can't really trust what the Bible says because it's not accurate. It's just a collection of stories that really have no connection to history, right? That's the Kool-Aid a lot of people drink. But the truth is, One of the great things about the Bible is that it's rooted and grounded in actual history. It's the stories of real people in real places, encountering a real God in real life. And and that's why when you read through the Bible, you find hundreds of references to historical events and cities and towns and people, all kinds of details woven throughout the pages of Scripture. And here's the interesting thing. When you compare what's in the Bible with what we know now from history and archaeology, we discover that the Bible is incredibly accurate, even down to the smallest details. I mean, I could give you dozens of examples. I'll just give you three of my favorite. Okay, so the first example I'll give you comes from a book of the Bible called the Book of of Romans. And the book of Romans was a letter written to Christians in Rome. It was written by Paul, and he wrote this while he was living in the city of Corinth. And so at the end of this letter, he throws in some words of personal greeting. It just says this, Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, send you his greetings. Erastus, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother Cordus send you their greetings. And so it's just kind of a random reference at the end of this letter to one of the Christians living there in the city of Corinth who was sending his greetings to the Christians in Rome, something you would typically see in a letter. Well, in the 1950s, archaeologists were digging in the ruins of what was once the city of Corinth, and they found a stone with this inscription. It said, Erastus, curator of public buildings, laid this pavement at his own expense. Do you know what that means? It means that chiseled in stone is the name of this guy whose name is in the pages of the Bible with exactly the same job description. I mean, that's how accurate the Bible is. Let me give you a second example. This one actually comes from a story, a news story in Time Magazine entitled, Score One for the Bible. Fresh clues support the story of Joshua at the walls of Jericho. And it's a fascinating article uh, describing what archaeologists discovered when they excavated the site where the ancient city of Jericho once stood. Now, for background, let me read what the Bible says about how Jericho was conquered by the people of Israel. This is in Joshua chapter 6. It says, When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, and so every man charged straight in, and they took the city. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it, and they put the silver and gold, but they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. Now, that's really interesting and seems a little bit hard to believe, 
But that's what the Bible says happened. Now, here's what archaeologists discovered when they uncovered the remains of the city of Jericho. And I'm quoting from Time magazine. The city's walls had fallen in a way suggestive of sudden collapse. Bushels of grain were found on the site. That is consistent with the Bible's assertions that Jericho was conquered quickly. If the city had capitulated after a long siege, the grain would have been used up. A thick layer of soot at the site, which according to radioactive carbon-14 dating, was laid down about 1400 B.C., supports the biblical idea that the city was burned, not simply conquered. Fascinating. That's from Time Magazine. Let me give you one more example from an article that appeared a few years ago in the magazine U.S. News and World Report. And this article is entitled, Is the Bible True? Subtitled, New Discoveries Offer Surprising Support for Key Moments in the Scriptures. And it's a fascinating article that, that describes a number of recent discoveries in archaeology that confirm some of the details of the Bible. And uh, one example from this article is, is a detail surrounding the birth of Jesus. This is in Luke chapter 3, verse 1. It says, in the, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and then it, it goes on. But that one little phrase states three things, okay? It says, number one, that Pontius Pilate existed. Number two, that he was governor of Judea at that time. And number three, that he served as governor of Judea during the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Okay? But here's the problem. For hundreds of years, there was no evidence outside the Bible that a man named Pontius Pilate ever even existed. And many critics of the Bible assume that Pontius Pilate was just kind of this made-up character to make the story more interesting. But then archaeologists discovered a stone with this inscription. Pontius Pilate, it says, the prefect of Judea, or governor, has dedicated to the people of Caesarea a temple in honor of Tiberius Caesar, which tells us three things. Number one, Pontius Pilate existed. Number two, that he was indeed the governor of Judea. And number three, that he served during the reign of Tiberius Caesar. So U.S. News and World Report goes on to say this. The discovery of the pilot stone has been widely acclaimed as a significant affirmation of biblical history because, in short, it confirms that the man depicted in the Gospels as Judea's Roman governor had precisely the responsibilities and authority that the Gospel writers ascribe to him. I gave you three examples all to say this. When it comes to the details of history, the Bible is amazingly accurate, down to the smallest details. And there are hundreds of examples I could give you. Now, I don't think that our faith should rest on archaeology. I'm not saying that. But it is good to know that what we read in the pages of the Bible is not the product of myth or legend. It is rooted and grounded in verifiable history, and it stands up to scrutiny. So if someone were to ask you, you know, isn't the Bible just a bunch of myths and legends? No, you can answer them this way. You could say no. Archaeology and secular history have repeatedly confirmed that the Bible is an accurate record of real events. Okay, moving on. Question number three that you hear from time to time. Very common question. It's this. The Bible was written hundreds of years ago, and we don't have the original copies, so how can we know what it really said? Now, in order to answer this question, I have to talk about ancient history and ancient manuscripts, and it's a little bit deep and it's a little bit complicated. So here's the deal. I will do my best not to bore you if you will do your best to pay close attention for the next few minutes, okay? So today we have Bibles, but uh, 2,000 years ago there were no books, no printing presses, no word processing programs on computers, right? We all know that. So what people did is they wrote important documents on what was called papyrus, and papyrus was made from reeds that were pressed flat and then woven together. It was the nearest thing they had in the first century to paper. And so the picture you're seeing on the screen right now is actually a copy of the last chapter of 1 Peter that dates back to about 200 A.D. Okay, that was papyrus. Now eventually, if you had a document that was being read by lots of people, the papyrus would start to decay and fall apart. It had a lifespan of about 30 or 50 years. 
And so what they had to do was keep making new copies of it. So when you go to the store and you purchase a Bible today, if you still buy a paper Bible, you're buying what is a copy of a copy of a copy. Now, that raises an obvious question. How do we know that the Bible we have today matches what was originally written? And so a lot of people look at the Bible and they compare it to a game we used to play when we were kids, a game called Telephone or Gossip, you know, where you would have a long line of kids and they would whisper a message from one person to the next, and you would get to the end of the line and the final message would sound nothing like the original message. And that's how some people think we got the Bible. But listen, that is not an accurate comparison at all, okay? So first of all, these were written documents, There is a big difference between repeating something you hear and making a copy of something in writing. And listen to this. The books of the Bible were so sacred that copies were made very meticulously by people called scribes. And they would double and triple check every letter and every manuscript. And if they found the smallest mistake, they would actually burn the document to make sure that that mistake was completely eliminated. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that because these documents were so important and because the church was growing so quickly, copies were constantly being made long before the old ones wore out. And so this was not one copy replacing another copy in a linear fashion over a long time. No, the translation of these documents was exponential. The number of copies was growing in multiples in the first hundred years of the existence of the Christian church. And so the result of that is that today there are thousands of very old copies of the Bible. And these have been discovered by archaeologists not only in Israel, but also in places as far away as Egypt and Africa and the Middle East. And when you have multiple copies of the same document from very different places, what you can do is compare those copies and get a very accurate picture of what the original document said, even if you don't have the original document. Now, Before I explain how that all applies to the Bible itself, I want to look at some other books from that same time period, okay? So this is a book called Caesar's Gallic War, okay? It describes the military victories of Julius Caesar, who was the first Roman Empire. This book is based on original documents that were written sometime around 44 BC, okay? This is translated from that original source. Uh, We don't have the primary source anymore, but this is the the source for information we have about Julius Caesar. It's quoted all the time in high school history classes. Uh, We don't have the original writing, but we do have 10 surviving copies of the original. However, the earliest surviving copy dates only back to 900 A.D., about 1,000 years after the original was written, okay? I'll give you another example. This is a book called The Twelve Caesars. It tells the story of the first 12 leaders of the Roman Empire. This was originally written, the original document, in the year 120 120 A.D. Uh, Again, we don't have the original writing, but there are eight surviving copies that we have. And the oldest copy we have is from about 950 A.D. So that's about 800 years after the original was written. One more example. This is a book called The Annals of Imperial Rome. This book, uh, the original documents, were written by a man named Tacitus around 100 A.D. Now, Tacitus is quoted everywhere when you study Roman history. Like, this is the gold standard for Roman history. And again, we don't have the original writing, but there are 20 surviving copies of this. The oldest copy we have is from about 1100 A.D., about a 1,000 years after the original was put into writing. Now, no one questions whether these books are accurate records of first century history. It's just assumed that they are. But in comparison, let's talk about the books in the New Testament. Okay? Uh, They were written in 50 to 100 A.D. Today, listen to this, we have 5,686 full or partial manuscripts of the original documents of the New Testament, and these date back as far as 105 A.D., and they're still discovering manuscripts today all the time. Here's what that means. We have way better information about a Jewish carpenter from Israel than we do about the Roman emperors who ruled the world in his day. 
In fact, if you take a class in high school or college on Roman history and they ask you to write a paper on one of these books, I dare you to write this. I don't believe any of this really happened because there aren't enough surviving copies of the original documents, right? You, you would never do that. But listen, here's the bottom line. The New Testament is 99.5% textually pure. In the entire text of 20,000 lines, only 40 lines are in doubt, and none affects any significant doctrine. So, I know that's a little bit complicated, but here's the bottom line. If someone were to ask you this question, the Bible was written hundreds of years ago, and we don't have the original copies, so how can we know what it really said? Here's how you can answer that. The books of the Bible are the best preserved documents in history. Now, one last question. Since the Bible was written so long ago, can it really make a difference in my life today? And the, the resounding answer to that question is yes. In fact, on that question, let's allow the Bible to speak for itself. This comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3. It says, all scripture is God-breathed, in, in other words, inspired by God himself, and is useful and not just useful like a phone book is useful, not just useful like an encyclopedia is useful. It's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, the, the truth contained within the pages of the Bible has the ability to transform your life, your marriage, uh, your family. I mean, we could spend the next several hours inviting people to come and stand here with me and tell their stories, and they would describe how they have been changed by encountering God in the pages of Scripture. You know, there was a time in our culture when most people looked to God's Word for direction and lived by its principles. But now as a culture, the truth is we have largely abandoned any belief in the Bible. We're drinking the Kool-Aid that says that it can't be trusted. And we're seeing the results of that in our newspaper headlines. I mean, imagine what would happen if we as a culture were to make God's word a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Imagine what would happen if our political leaders would really embrace the teaching of Jesus when he said the greatest among you must be servant of all. Imagine what would happen if all of us conducted our relationships according to the words of the Apostle Paul when he said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Imagine what would happen in our families if every husband followed the words of Ephesians 5 that says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Imagine how generous we would all be if we took seriously the words of Jesus when he says, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. You know, we can't control what happens in our culture, but here's what we can control. We can control what happens in our lives and in our minds. So today, I want to give you a very practical challenge. It's this. Make it a habit to set aside a few minutes every day to open the scriptures and to seek to encounter God in those words. Let the wisdom of the Bible change your heart and your mind. And, and here's why I want to challenge you to do this. Because one of the most important decisions you will make in life is deciding what fills your mind on a regular basis. Think of it this way. Imagine you decide you want to get into NASCAR racing. And you go out and buy the greatest performance car in the world. And you decide that you're going to take a serious run at the Daytona 500 next year. Here's my question. Would you fill the gas tank with unleaded, low-octane gasoline from a Turkey Hill Minute market? I doubt it. Or imagine you're really serious about competing in the 2021 Olympics. You want to run the marathon. How likely is it that you would go on a Twinkies and Oreo cookie diet between now and the games? You wouldn't. See, we tend to be very careful about what we put into the things that matter to us. A lot of people are really careful about what they put into their cars, what they put into their bodies, even what they feed their pets, because we know that whatever we put into those things will ultimately determine their performance and their well-being. But listen to this. What you put into your mind is a much more important concern than what you put into anything else you own or possess. And when we begin to encounter God in the pages of the Bible, it will change us. It will be a lamp 
to our feet and a light to our path. So don't drink the Kool-Aid of our culture that says God's word is just myths and legends and it can't be trusted. It is his communication from his heart to ours. Now, if you're watching this service with a few other people or a group of people, I want you to take a few minutes to talk about how this applies to your lives because like I say every single week, the real impact from this teaching is not what I've said, it's what you put into practice.